For those of you who are regular viewers of our channel, the following scene is probably not new to you. Western economists have repeatedly foretold for nearly two decades that a financial crisis would strike at the drop of a hat in China. In particular, as China enters the post-epidemic era of 2023, the debt level of its financial system has been shockingly high. Economic indicators calculated according to Western economics show that China's financial system should have crashed long ago. However, China hasn't seen any major outbreak of an obvious financial crisis. So, what's going on? Can the Chinese Communist Party or CCP challenge the traditional theories of economics infinitely? When will its financial doom strike? In this episode, we will explore this topic. First, let's look at the phenomena of bank runs. A financial crisis is usually manifested through massive bank failures as a result of a bank run. Other manifestations are the real estate crash and the fall in house prices, the stock market meltdown, the depression of all industries, and the mounting unemployment rate as a result. In general, the immediate cause of a bank failure is a sudden run from depositors. Even if a bank is in good financial condition, it may collapse because of a run. In March 2023, the Silicon Valley Bank in the US collapsed quickly due to a bank run, even though its financial situation didn't deteriorate to the extent of collapsing. That month, Signature Bank also collapsed, and then First Republic Bank went into crisis and was acquired by J.P. Morgan Chase after being taken over by the FDIC. The U.S. Treasury Department was forced to quickly state that all depositors' funds should be fully repaid in order to prevent small and medium-sized banks from collapsing on a large scale, as in 1929 and 1933. In the past three years in China, the quality of bank assets has deteriorated. The situation is far worse than that of Silicon Valley Bank. There have been some individual bank failures in China, but so far there has been no chain of bank failures. This is because, despite China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001, decades of economic reforms and slow but steady integration into the global financial system, China remains anything but a full-fledged market economy. On the one hand, most of the funds of the banks have gone to inefficient state-owned enterprises or have been spent heavily on projects in which the local governments have invested blindly, thus leading to many bad debts. On the other hand, the privileged class will make use of the power in their hands to divert bank funds for their own use. The CCP pays huge sums of money every year for the so-called maintenance of stability. Instead of addressing the root causes of the problems, it tries to address the people whom it believes are causing the problems. As a result, they have put a lot of effort into preventing a run on depositors, and has amassed more than enough measures in this regard, such as mobilizing the police or mafia forces to assault and threaten the populace. On May 14, 2023, more than 1,300 police officers were deployed in advance in Zhengzhou City, Hernan Province, to detain people at various strategic locations. Depositors of Anhui Village Bank in Hernan Province haven't been able to withdraw their deposits for more than a year, and the authorities have included depositors in their high-intensity stability maintenance list. The depositors were unable to enter Zhengzhou and later moved to another city to express their demands. The police used tear gas to disperse the crowd, and many people were dragged through the streets and injured as a result. The CCP has a range of treatments targeting different depositors. While the government claims to have made payments to small depositors, large depositors are left empty-handed and subjected to severe repression. After news of the brutal persecution became known, other depositors lost the courage to demand their deposits back. So, can a depositor sue a bank through legal means? In theory, yes, but in practice, sadly, no. Depositors usually fail to win their cases against banks. Such examples abound. The four major banks of the CCP are state-owned and backed by the CCP government, and they are also the ATMs and CCP elite. Even the village banks have the backing of local CCP officials, so depositors are basically powerless to sue the banks. I lost my mother. My mother never saw the money return before she passed away. The bank has not returned a single penny to me. 
What am I still doing alive when you, the Bank of Henan, won't give me the money you owe me? Help! There's no justice. My child can't afford the schooling, and he has to go to work. Henan Bank, give me back my deposit. According to the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission, by the end of 2021, there were 4,602 banks in China, 90% of which were small local banks, accounting for 28% of the total assets of the banking system. According to public data, in 2021, high-risk small banks accounted for 10% of the total number of banks, or about 400. In 2019, China's high-risk small and medium-sized banks reached more than 500. That is to say, at least over a thousand small and medium-sized banks were in a high-risk situation. The CCP tried to defuse the risk by merging and restructuring small local banks. It's very difficult. Most of the debtors of small local banks are local government financing platforms as well as private enterprises. China's economy took a big slide during the three-year epidemic. Dr. Cheng Xiaonong, an expert on Chinese affairs and an economic expert, wrote on Radio Free Asia on February 27, 2023, that according to China's public figures, the total debt of China's central and local governments was as high as 110 trillion yuan, or 15.4 trillion U.S. dollars, which is equivalent to 91 percent of China's GDP, significantly higher than the internationally recognized warning line of 60 percent. Private enterprises in China are in even worse shape, and small local banks are in a dangerous position. We are afraid that depositors of small and medium-sized banks are caught in a difficult predicament. So banks have made it easy to deposit money and difficult to withdraw it for the average person. Just yesterday, I still had funds in my bank card, but suddenly I couldn't make a normal payment. I can only deposit money, not withdraw cash. Now I come to the bank to unlock the card. I have waited for a full two hours. The efficiency of this bank is indeed a bit slow, but now I finally fixed it. Yesterday, my bank card suddenly stopped working. I couldn't use it. I was shopping and tried to swipe the card, but it wouldn't work. The machine indicated your bank card has abnormalities. I immediately deposit some money into the card. It can't accept deposits. Ah, very strange. Then I wanted to transfer money out, but it wouldn't allow me. Then it indicates your card has an abnormality and is suspended. It is simply not working now. The bank does not notify us at all. I was scared when I suddenly encountered this situation. I thought something terrible had happened because I had funds in the card. Today, I rushed to ICBC and waited in line. I was surprised to see all the people inside doing the same thing. I am not the only one experiencing this problem. Many are in this situation. Ah. The CCP would target specific depositors using the so-called stability maintenance operation. That is to say, depositors of a failing bank would be down on their luck. The second and most important element is the transfer of the crisis to the Chinese public at large. The Chinese government has virtually unlimited power to direct resources as it sees fit, allowing it to distribute the pain to avert the crisis. The CCP has been passing on the debt to every Chinese person to get rid of bad debts for banks. How does the government carry out this task? Let's use a real-life example from 1999 to 2000 to illustrate. In that period, the four leading banks: Bank of China, Industrial Commercial Bank of China (ICBC), Agricultural Bank of China, and Construction Bank of China had accumulated a huge amount of non-performing loans or NPLs and were on the verge of collapse. The party leader at the time was Jiang Zemin. His government came up with the stunt of setting up four major asset management companies (AMCs) or debt clearing firms. The Ministry of Finance allocated RMB 10 billion yuan as registered capital to each of the four major companies. The central bank provided a refinancing of RMB 570 billion yuan, and the four companies then issued RMB 820 billion yuan of bonds to the respective banks. In this way, the four major companies got a total of more than RMB 1.4 trillion yuan, or US 196 billion. These funds were used to buy out the U.S. 196 billion of bad debts. 
The Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank of China are funded through taxation and printing money. Frankly, this move means the CCP stepped up its efforts in scrounging money from the people. After the big four companies received the bad debts from the banks, which were basically uncollectible, the bad debts were then transferred to the Ministry of Finance and became government liabilities, which were ultimately paid for by the entire population. After the transfer of U.S. 196 billion of bad debts, the NPL volume of the four state-owned banks was still high. At the end of 2002, the NPL ratio of the banks averaged 26.12 percent. Among them, NPL ratio of ICBC was 26.01 percent, Agricultural Bank 36.65 percent, Bank of China 25.56 percent, and China Construction Bank 15.28 percent. At the time, the shortfall in the capital was huge. At the time, China's state finances were already struggling, and it was no longer possible to rely on financial disbursements to absorb banks' bad debts. Therefore, the CCP came up with the idea of stock reform, that is, the listing of large and medium-sized banks to raise money to alleviate the crisis. Thus, the third element emerged, that is, the power of Wall Street in the U.S. entered the scene, and international investors started footing the bill for it. In 2005, the Construction Bank of China was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, with Morgan Stanley as one of the global joint sponsors. And in 2006, the Bank of China was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, raising more than HK 75.4 billion, with Goldman Sachs as one of the joint sponsors. Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley also each served as a joint global coordinator for the listing of major banks. Does the sophisticated Wall Street understand the Chinese government's tactics and the risks involved? Of course it does. To both the Chinese Communist government and Wall Street, there are huge profits to be made for both parties. Therefore, they have kept silent to investors in the international capital market. Look at the huge profits made by Wall Street back then. Goldman Sachs took a stake in ICBC in 2006 and eventually made a profit of more than U.S. 7.28 billion. In June 2005, the Bank of America invested U.S. 3 billion in the China Construction Bank, and two years later, it made a profit of more than U.S. 30 billion. In March 2004, the NPL ratio of Bank of China, Agricultural Bank of China, ICBC, and China Construction Bank was about 19%. After the listing, by the end of 2007, the average NPL ratio of the five state-owned banks dropped to 8.05 percent. Research staff at the People's Bank of China concluded the report in this way: the NPL ratio of China's state-owned commercial banks fell relatively sharply from 29.18 percent in 2000 to 8.2 percent at the end of March 2007. This is attributed to the approval given by the Chinese Communist government to the listing of state-owned banks to raise money. During those years, there was no significant improvement in the operation of the banking sector, nor was there any reduction in corruption. It can be said that China's banks transferred their risks to shareholders at home and abroad through their listing. It's just that the rapid growth of China's economy at that time brought about higher output and employment, and the financial risks derived therefrom were intentionally ignored by all parties. This is like the Ponzi scheme in China's real estate economy, where someone must pick up the final baton. China Securities Daily reported in early July 2023 that by the end of 2022, 90% of 42 A-share listed Chinese banks had below net asset value. This means that stocks had their closing price fall below their net asset value amid the current sliding stock market. It's a clear indication of a banking crisis. As share prices fell, shareholders suffered heavy losses. The average bad debt ratio of the U.S. banking industry was 2.5 percent for the period from March 1, 1985, to December 1, 2022. So, what is the NPL or non-performing loan ratio of Chinese banks these days? In April 2023, the financial reports of the six major state-owned banks in China showed that in 2022, the Bank of China's NPL ratio was as high as 7.23%. An increase of 2.18 percentage points compared to 2021. ICBC's NPL ratio was 6.14 percent, an increase of 1.35 percentage points, and the Agricultural Bank of China was 5.48 percent, an increase of 2.09 percentage points. Three other state-owned banks also saw their real estate NPL ratios increase compared to 2021. The real numbers should be much higher. This is because a huge shadow banking sector exists in China. 
Charlene Chu, a Chinese banking analyst who worked for Fitch Ratings, said in 2016, "Considering the risk of shadow banking, the actual NPL ratio of China's banking sector is at 22%." In April 2023, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a U.S.-based think tank, released a report saying that at the heart of China's debt problem is the growth of shadow banking. It makes loans like a bank, but is not bound by the regulatory framework of traditional banks. According to the report, for years, local governments in China have financed infrastructure projects by raising debt. By 2016, the Communist Party's top brass faced the challenge of slowing the growth of overall debt and shrinking the size of shadow banking while avoiding too great a shock to the overall economy, which could lead to unemployment and social unrest. China's regulators have enacted a series of policies aimed at limiting debt growth, with a focus on limiting local government debt. These policies aimed at reducing leverage have basically helped stabilize China's debt levels, but as a side effect, China's economic activities have declined sharply since the beginning of 2018, and real estate developers have rushed to look for funding aside from the shadow banks. As shadow bank loans were pulled back, developers had to rely on home presales to raise funds. Some Chinese developers have begun to use presale money for their business operations, making home buyers the real estate developers' money bags instead of the shadow banks. By 2021, Chinese home buyers had financed about U.S. one trillion in property construction annually. This sort of scam-like financing system has propped up China's real estate sector, China's main engine of growth, for the past 20 years. When Chinese real estate giant Evergrande defaulted on its debt in December 2021, prompting a major downturn in construction and sales, disastrous consequences followed. We are now seeing many rotten tail properties in China, with the consequent phenomena of home buyers having to collectively stop paying their mortgages. I am a victim of a rotten tail building. Our building was said to be finished on June 30th, so I came here to see if it was finished. It looks the same as before. The front gate won't allow me to visit. I sneaked in from the back. I don't hear any construction noise. I looked inside to see if anyone was there. They always say that the construction is almost finished. See, on such a big construction site, there is not a single person. They first told us that the project would be completed on June 30th, and then they said that it would be completed on October 30th. They have been postponing the project again and again. The building occupies 400 mu or 66 acres of land. This is how it'll end up. It can be said that the CCP itself, which sets the policies, is the source of the real trouble, and they can't solve their own problems. China's official figures show the domestic RMB loan balance reached 213.99 trillion yuan in 2022. If you calculate based on the non-performing rate of 22%, the bad debt balance would be around 45 trillion yuan. While GDP for the same period was 120 trillion yuan and fiscal revenue was about 20 trillion, in 2022 China issued 28 trillion yuan of new money, the most in history. Previously, China's renminbi issuance was based on increased foreign exchange reserves. Now it is likely to be based on the bad debts of the banks. In other words, the more bad debts banks have, the more renminbi will be printed, and the less valuable Chinese renminbi will be in the hands of Chinese people. The last item in the exclusive tactic of the CCP is to use the digitization of the RMB to further defuse the banking crisis. China has now introduced digitalization, also known as electronic renminbi. When the currency is digitized, there is no more paper money, hence no more run on the banks. Moreover, the cost of printing and distributing banknotes will be eliminated, and in the future, cash counting machines and cash dispensers may not even be needed. Changshu City in Jiangsu Province has introduced full digital RMB payment of salaries from May 2023 for civil servants, government-related organizations and institutions, and state-owned enterprises at all levels. An increasing number of provincial and municipal civil servant salaries have begun to be paid in digital currency. In fact, electronic currency existing before has been closely monitored, including every transaction and business dealing in both public and private sectors. Banks in China keep track of every penny spent by an individual or group on their accounts. The implication is that people's money can be restricted, frozen, or even erased at the drop of a hat at any time. Having said all that, the Chinese government can only temporarily mitigate the crisis through the various measures mentioned. 
The inevitable consequence is that every day the bad debts of the banks increase, the wealth of the Chinese people will decrease accordingly. The CCP has repeatedly proved the financial doom predictions wrong by capitalizing on the peculiarities of the red system. However, this time it should be extremely difficult to divert it again. Because the fundamental problems with China's banking sector remain unresolved, the Chinese regime now faces the most daunting set of economic challenges since it began opening up to the outside world in the late 1970s. They include high debt levels, sluggish real estate, prolonged economic slowdown, rising unemployment, an aging and shrinking population, and deterioration in its trade and diplomatic relations with the U.S. China's banking crisis will probably break out in full force around the time the CCP regime collapses. It will inflict great pain on the people at home and abroad, especially the people in China. Given the considerable volume of China's trade with the rest of the world, if the banking crisis happens in China, no one will be able to rescue it. We would see another financial disaster that's worldwide in scope.